My guest today is Norman Solomon. He's a journalist, author, media critic, anti-war activist. And in 2012, he was a candidate for the United States House of Representatives from California's fighting second congressional district. Uh, his most recent book is Made Love, Got War, Close Encounters with America's Warfare State, which is a great title. He recently wrote a feature story in The Nation about the Obama administration's war on whistleblowers, specifically the case of the Wall Street Journal's James Rison, who's being threatened with imprisonment if he doesn't reveal his sources. Uh, a couple of more things I think are very interesting about uh, Norman is that uh, he's a longtime associate of the media watch group Fairness and Accuracy in Reporting, which uh, I'm a big fan of. And, uh, in 1997, he founded the Institute for Public Accuracy, an organization described as a national consortium of independent public policy researchers, analysts, and activists. And, and this is a quite an, a nice badge of honor, when he was 14 years old, the FBI started surveillance on him, <laughs> which is nice. Norman, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks, Jimmy. It's a pleasure. Uh, so you... Uh, I just want to, we, I'd like to talk about the media, but let's get to the James Rison case first, right? Because that's in the news right now. Can you explain to the people what Operation Merlin was? Yeah, Operation Merlin was a really stupid and dangerous activity by the CIA back in 2000. So we're talking just about 15 years ago uh, when the folks in Langley decided that it would be very cool to bring some faulty nuclear weapons blueprints and give them to the Iranian government on the theory that it would screw up their nuclear program, which then uh, was believed to be a nuclear weapons program. Uh, the U.S. government later determined that a few years after that, uh, Iran abandoned its nuclear uh, weapons development effort. Uh, so long story short, the CIA uh, got a Russian emigre physicist to hand over those nuclear blueprints uh, to uh, the Iranian government in an office in Vienna, Austria. And uh, the reason that we're aware of that now is that in 2006, the New York Times reporter James Risen reported on it in a book. And he put it in his book after the New York Times refused to publish that information for more than uh, two years. That is really part of the media backdrop of this story. And right now, on the verge of 2015, uh, we're looking at a trial where a former CIA officer is accused of providing that classified information uh, to James Risen that eventually wound up in the book. So what they're trying to do is they're trying to, so just to recap, uh, the, the, the geniuses in the American government thought that they could sidetrack the Iranians from getting a nuclear program by giving them inaccurate and incorrect blueprints on how to build a nuclear bomb. It turned, and then they had a Russian uh, scientist give them this stuff and work with them, and he was supposed to help misdirect them, but he did, and he actually kind of corrected some of the mistakes in the blueprint. They end up, it ended up helping them. So it backfired, this brilliant scheme. And uh, so James Risen writes about this. And now the government, the Barack Obama Justice Department, wants to prosecute the CIA uh, member who gave the information to James Risen about this. And they want James Risen to reveal that he was his source. Am I, am I correct? Well, yes, allegedly... Jeffrey Sterling, who's going on trial, the former CIA official, is allegedly the source. Uh, that's the contention uh, and the issue of the trial. Uh, but it should be said that whether the indictment is correct or not, whether Sterling was the source for the journalist James Risen, everybody agrees that Mr. Sterling went to the Senate Intelligence Committee staff and told them about this really dangerous CIA operation after it took place. So that's why we can say that whether Sterling is quote unquote guilty or not of the charges, Sterling is a whistleblower. And let's be clear, the Obama administration hates whistleblowers. As a matter of fact, in a court filing several years ago, the Obama Justice Department said that 
a whistleblower is apt to be more pernicious and worse than a foreign spy, uh, which at first glance makes no sense until you realize that the Obama administration is hell bent on preventing the American people from learning what is being done with our tax dollars in our name in a supposed democracy. So the uninformed consent of the governed is really the Obama goal. But I thought Barack Obama promised transparency and to have the most open administration in U.S. history. You're telling me he's not doing that? <laughs> um, you know, he is uh, talking very enlightened and governing very regressive on the whole, which, you know, is not the first time a president has done that. It's been um, a wide gap uh, time after time for many decades, if not longer. But this gap has now widened into a chasm because, as you say, uh, Obama came in and he actually continues to say uh, that he would have the, quote, most transparent administration in history. In fact, by many measures, he, he's had the least transparent. Um, the Obama administration is collectively run by control freaks, and they have instituted a wide array of measures, not only repression of whistleblowers, not only the uh, surveillance and subpoenas towards journalists, but also programs uh, such as the insider threat program, and I put that in air quotes, insider threat, where millions of federal government employees are told that they must keep an eye on their coworkers unless they see an insider threat. If they do see an insider threat, uh, they should inform their superior. So this is sort of a, a low-grade uh, 21st century uh, neo-McCarthy sort of an atmosphere that the administration is trying to foment. Um, it's not just the so-called national security arena. As a matter of fact, in the piece that Marcy Wheeler and I uh, wrote for The Nation magazine back in late October, uh, we quote uh, the Washington bureau chief of the Associated Press, who mentions that the transportation beat reporter, in other words, the AP reporter covering transportation federal policies uh, for Associated Press, is told that uh, people at the transportation department won't talk to uh, the Associated Press because if they even talk about, say, safety issues without authorization, uh, they could be fired. So this is the kind of atmosphere uh, that o Obama is creating. And uh, let me uh, be clear that I didn't come into this Obama era with any animosity towards Barack Obama or his presidency. As a matter of fact, from Northern California, I was elected as an Obama delegate to the 2008 Democratic National Convention. So with me, as with I think at this point, many millions of people, um, President Obama has earned the aversion that he now has. Now, I'm sure that the media is going to be going crazy about all this repression of journalism, right? Is, is that happening in America? Well, it's been a mixture. Uh, you know, let me put on my organizing hat here. As you mentioned, I, you know, I wrote a, a long piece with, with Marcy Wheeler for The Nation about this, and I am a journalist. I'm also an activist. And I think that we have to fight for our rights, certainly fight to defend the First Amendment for freedom of the press every day, fight for the Fourth Amendment against general warrants and unwarranted search and seizure, fight for the Fifth Amendment uh, that includes the right to due process. As has been pointed out, due process is supposed to be spelled D-U-E process, not just what the president wants to do. And so as the co-founder of the online media and political activist group called rootsaction.org, um, I helped launch a petition that eventually got the support of many other organizations and more than 100,000 people signed the petition telling President Obama and Attorney General Holder to end all legal actions against James Risen and to affirm rather than attack the principle of journalists having a confidentiality relationship with sources. Uh, the administration's uh, policies, though, are just the opposite. So, so do you? So, do you think the? Um, why do you think there's not more outrage in the public about the repressive uh, tactics of the Obama administration, as as uh, you're describing right now? I mean, uh, it is he, so he's he's worse even than George Bush, correct? Well, in the sense of uh, many aspects of civil liberties, 
uh, he has continued the negative trend that George W. Bush instituted. So, yeah, I think it's a little bit of uh, take the George W. Bush administration in terms of civil liberties and uh, surveillance and rights of reporters and journalists and the public to know we've got the Bush administration on steroids with the Obama administration. So, so let's, so let's, well, so, and this is coming to, uh, there are some recent developments in this James Rice, right, James Rice and case, it, correct? Yes, it is, uh, so to speak, coming to a head in January of 2015. I think because of so much pressure that gradually uh, has developed against the Department of Justice, uh, they have uh, beat a retreat. But as the saying goes, retreat should not be confused with surrender. So uh, in December of 2014, the uh, Department of Justice has said, well, you know, after more than six years of threatening James Risen with jail for not ratting on his sources, the Justice Department is now saying, well, we won't insist that Risen identify his sources, but we still want to put him on the witness stand and uh, have him talk about some of his access to confidential sources and so forth. And what may happen in that federal trial is that a slippery slope uh, is approached by the Department of Justice, and they're going to try to drag Risen partway down it. So he begins to answer questions that seem sort of reasonable, like, did you write that book? Did you write that article? But, you know, one question can lead to another, and they want to really put Risen in a bind. And there's also some indication that the Justice Department wants to create a gap or a wedge between Risen and Sterling. I think we should be clear. Um, in an extraordinary way, James Risen has been very courageous and very principled. And frankly, you don't find a lot of New York Times uh, journalists who have that kind of a record. Uh, and meanwhile, uh, Sterling, I think of as sort of the invisible man. He was one of the few African Americans working in uh, an official, uh, independently minded, you might say, professional job. I mean, he wasn't a janitor at the CIA. He was a professional um, and he was an African American employee of which there were very few. And one of the things that happened was uh, he filed a racial bias suit against the CIA and that went into federal court, which was unprecedented. And who was one of the top CIA officials at the time who helped to turn down uh, Sterling's uh, claim on racial bias? Well, it was a guy named John Brennan, who's now director of the CIA. Uh, so there's been a lot of hostility from the top of the CIA towards the defendant, uh, Jeffrey Sterling. And there's been a lot of hostility towards James Risen from the CIA because he's a tough reporter. He doesn't just suck up to the latest news release and the official leaks and plants from top officials. He actually digs and exposes a lot of the uh, repression and mendacity that are really standard operating procedure from the CIA and uh, certainly the Bush and Obama White Houses in terms of uh, the so-called war on terror. So why wouldn't, why do you think the New York Times uh, would not print this information that he acquired? It seems like that's exactly what the New York Times is supposed to do. Uh, why wouldn't they print this information that our attempt to deny Iran a nuclear, our scheme to deny Iran a nuclear bomb has kind of backfired? Why would they be hesitant? Well, because the Bush White House asked them not to publish it. And unfortunately, there's been a strong tendency from The New York Times when they really are under pressure to either delay sometimes for years uh, key stories uh, or to not publish them outright. As a matter of fact, uh, the New York Times refused to publish a blockbuster story written by James Risen and Eric Lichtblau uh, that they had ready by the middle of October 2004, which was uh, weeks before the presidential election between Bush and Kerry. And under pressure, uh, the <clears throat> New York Times refused to publish that story, even though it was ready, and waited a full 14 months and eventually published it in mid-late December uh, in a couple of installments, 2005. Well, 
Why did they eventually publish it after waiting for 14 months? Uh, it's because uh, James Risen was so fed up with the censorship of his own editors at the New York Times that he was about to come out with a book with some of that information in it as well. So, you know, this has been a classic problem. Sometimes uh, the New York Times has been a profile in courage. Sometimes, often, too often, it has been a profile in cowardice. And this has again been documented uh, just recently with the release of the Senate Intelligence Committee report on torture, uh, where one of the revelations, which was partially known before, uh, is that uh, the uh, Bush administration was successful in getting news media not to reveal the locations of the so-called black sites where uh, the CIA was sending uh, some suspects uh, that had been captured in Afghanistan and elsewhere uh, to be tortured by the CIA and then elsewhere uh, by other uh, governments and entities. And uh, actually, James Risen and New York Times uh, reporters had that information, were ready to publish it, and the, the publisher of the New York Times, in concert with the top editor, Bill Keller, basically uh, spiked the story for quite a while with the argument that it would harm uh, U.S. national security. Now, Jimmy, I don't know. I have been trying to think of how it hurts U.S. national security uh, for a newspaper to expose the name of the country where the U.S. government is illegally sending uh, prisoners and torturing them. I mean, what do you think? How does that harm U.S. national security? I don't get it unless it's a very warped definition of national security. Well, because when Bill Keller runs into uh, Brennan and Rumsfeld at the brunch on Martha's Vineyard, it will make it awkward. Oh, it would be very awkward. Yes, and that's what they can't. So the, the New York Times didn't even print torture for the longest time. They're, they're finally admitting that what the government did was torture, and they say they're against torture, yet they still run Maureen Dowd's columns. Uh, well, you know, I mean, there, there's a lot in the news media that might be a problem with the, the uh, Eighth Amendment and uh, the Geneva Conventions. I mean, uh, sometimes when I'm, I'm trapped in an elevator, I think I, I'm, uh, you know, being subjected to low-level torture. But, you know, seriously, uh, there is such an aversion in the U.S. media to call what something is what it is. Uh, when the U.S. government has done... Uh, so many terrible things uh, that have been documented now in the Senate intelligence report, but were documented for years by independent journalists. Uh, if it was done by Russia or China or Palestinians, uh, no problem. It would be called what it is. But when it's done by the U.S., then journalists have to fight for years to uh, get their editors to even call it approximately what it really is. So let's take a step back and let's talk about the larger issue uh, with the news media in the United States. Now, I don't know what it is. I was a bad student, but uh, uh, I could always see through how bullshit our media has become and how corporate it has become. And if you could just give us an idea, what is wrong? Because it used to be the, the news media was the watchdog, right? And they would keep an eye on the criminals and the corporations and Wall Street and, the, and, the, and our elected politicians. But that doesn't seem to be the case anymore. They kind of seem to be in bed with those people. Can you, can you explain why, how that happened and what the big problem is? Yeah, I, you know, I don't want to make the, the metaphor too uh, convoluted or torturous, but... Um, you know, the lap dogs are in bed with whatever. It's just really um, become uh, more overt in some way. It is really uh, no good old days to hark back to. You know, you can go 50 years back to the so-called Gulf of Tonkin incident where the U.S. government lied and the front pages and editorial pages immediately proclaimed the lies to be truth. That's how we were dragged in. Uh, to the Vietnam War. But that said, uh, there's a shamelessness uh, that has become so um, egregious and does become part of the wallpaper uh, of the media echo chamber that we are um, surrounded by. I I'm glad, Jimmy, that you mentioned uh, Fairness and Accuracy in Reporting, the group FAIR, which you know I've been proud to be an associate of, 
And uh, people can go to FAIR.org and just see the extent to which every day there are egregious through omission and commission uh, biases that, you know, have tremendous impacts. And this has everything to do with how uh, a president like Obama or uh, the leaders in the Congress uh, like uh, Pelosi and Boehner and McConnell and Reid, how they can cozy up to Wall Street, how they can uh, help to crush civil liberties, how they can uh, go along with the power of the uh, elite uh, Wall Street uh, uh, financial um, entities. And then there's a revolving door uh, between representatives of those financial interests, what you might call the military industrial surveillance complex, and people in the Treasury Department and elsewhere um, in executive uh, branch uh, high positions as well as Congress. So, um, you know, this is the way in which uh, the uh, lapdogs are um, sucking up to people in government power. And then likewise, the people in government power pat the head of the media lapdogs. And uh, the results, whether you want to go to healthcare, education, housing, war, surveillance, shredding of the civil liberties of our country, and we could go on and on, and I won't. Uh, this is really a negative um, downward spiral where the corporately owned and advertised upon, and in the case of NPR and PBS underwrite written media, are in a terribly uh, destructive spiral uh, with uh, top government officials. Well, um, I always like to point out that um, you know NPR and PBS say they're public. Right. It says public right in their names. But right. It's the middle uh, name. I was yeah. listening to NPR on the way here and uh, I heard three commercials for a bank. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. Uh, PB oh, yeah. PBS and, is largely yeah. funded by the Koch brothers. So the people they're supposed to be exposing seem to be funding them. And so if you're supposed to be investigate, so you're telling me that the Koch brothers are giving PBS money to investigate them. What they're actually doing is they're giving PBS money to non investigate them. Isn't that right? Yeah, it's a sort of a indirect version of hush money. And whether it's Walmart or whoever, you have just a whole slew of corporate so called underwriters. You know, I think part of it is like on PBS or the, the news hour on PBS, it, it's not a commercial because they play Mozart uh, and it's upper crust uh, targeting. So we're supposed to believe it's not a commercial. It's just enhanced underwriter credit or whatever the euphemism. But when you look at actual content, you know, I got to say, uh, by far, of course, the most powerful, influential, far reaching news programs on so-called public broadcasting uh, radio in this country are all things considered in morning edition. And, you know, in many ways, I find it almost unlistenable, uh, just the, the high degree of blather and stenography for corporate America, stenography for uh, top government positions in Washington. I mean, the viewpoints you get on foreign policy, especially, but a lot of other issues as well, on programs like all things considered in morning edition, uh, those uh, spectrums run the gamut from about A to C. And there's just an entire rest of the convention, uh, conceptual universe that's left out. So I think it is important for us to recognize that uh, this daily diet that many of us are force fed or, you know, partake of, of so-called public broadcasting, uh, it is really um, a constant propaganda drumbeat that has a very negative consequence. You know, half the country, I would even think that a lot of people who consider themselves liberal still consider the media liberal because they did a study a couple of years ago and they found out that most reporters voted for Barack Obama instead of John McCain and Sarah Palin. And, you know, what I say to that is like, yeah, because they don't vote, vote for an obvious lunatic and a person who reads less than Gomer Pyle, somehow that makes them liberal. And instead of taking a cue from the most informed people in the country, we dismiss their opinion because it doesn't line up with our already preconceived notions of what fairness is supposed to be. And what's happened in this country is they've replaced objectivity, which is a, a, a journalist is supposed to be objective, but they've replaced it with neutrality. So now all opinions are equal and nobody ever gets debunked. And you'll often turn on CNN and watch a tool like Chris Cuomo repeat a right wing talking point as if it's a fact instead of debunking it. 
So my, yeah. I, ha I always point people to the 1996 Telecommunications Act, which sounds really sexy, but uh, that I think that was that was done by a Democrat. Bill Clinton did that. And what that did was it got rid of all the rules that separated uh, all the media from each other. So instead of having comp and they did it in the in the vein of having more competition, which we know capitalism just eats itself. So what happens is we have less competition and we went from having 50 giant media companies in America to now we have six, right? And so we're left getting our anti-war message from MSNBC, which during the entire Iraq war was owned by General Electric, which is a goddamn defense contractor. Yeah, and yeah. they fired Phil Donahue. He had the number one rated show on MSNBC. And let's remember what MS stands for in that. MS stands for Microsoft, which is a giant corporation which is trying to wreck public education in America and privatize it, right? Also, NBC, which was owned by General Electric, which is a huge defense contractor. And during the run-up to the Iraq war, Phil Donahue was actually anti-war. And uh, they didn't really take well to that. So why don't you take it from there? Uh, despite uh, healthy ratings, uh, right before the uh, invasion of Iraq in 2003, the Phil Donahue uh, nightly primetime show on MSNBC was taken off the air. And later, a memo surfaced from a consultant hired by NBC saying that uh, we don't want to have our competitors be able to point uh, to uh, Phil Donahue's show as an uh, an unpatriotic, anti-war, anti-Bush um, program when our troops are out fighting. So uh, NBC just caved and uh, took him off the air. Uh, my uh, friend and colleague, uh, actually co-founded RootsAction.org with me, uh, Jeff Cohen, was a senior producer for Phil Donahue's program on MBC, and MSNBC. And he's written, uh, Jeff has written a, a hilarious but very sad book called Cable News Confidential, where he talks about just the lunacy of the top management, lunacy with an agenda of the top MSNBC management, where they would say, uh, oh, well, Phil, you know, if you're going to have a, a progressive anti-war person, then you have to have two conservative pro-war people. And then it got, well, if you're going to have one leftist, you have to have three right wingers. And, you know, Jeff commented at one point that if Donahue had had Noam Chomsky on the show, maybe they would have had to have 50 different right wingers just to outweigh him, you know. So this was just the, the the estrangement from any semblance of democratic discourse uh, has been extreme on the cable networks. And I would say, you know, Fox, MSNBC, CNN, they're all infected with that now. And so Fox is a uh, mouthpiece for uh, the Republican Party, and the uh, MSNBC is a mouthpiece. Uh, for the Democratic Party. And that's not what we need. We need some independent media who are fearless. You know, we have people uh, who are hosts of MSNBC. And, you know, Al Sharpton's one of them. Who's, he said, um, well, I will never criticize President Obama. Well, what does that tell you? Um, it's like people at Fox, in effect, uh, saying, not in so many words, well, I will never criticize President Bush. Uh, that's how we get into wars and our civil liberties get shredded because uh, so many people in the news media are suck-ups to power. What would you say the difference between Fox News and MSNBC is? If there's a difference, the difference is they're just, uh, because both parties are owned by the same people, right? So the Democrats and Barack Obama's la latest Cromnibus bill proved that the Democrats and the Republicans uh, genuflect to Wall Street and money, and that there really isn't a difference. In, in there's no big difference between them. So how do you think, I mean, people look at Rachel Maddow and they say, oh, well, she's liberal. Um, I say as soon as she starts costing a corporation money, they'll get rid of her just like they get rid of Phil Donahue. So what she's doing is really nothing. She's not doing anything, right? Well, there's certainly boundaries that uh, can't be crossed over. And uh, when some uh, folks uh, cross the boundaries, they're shown the door, the ratings notwithstanding. Um, I would say that uh, Fox is targeting uh, certain political demographics. And MSNBC, and this has been a real change since the Phil Donahue days, has carved out its own explicit political demographics, and they're trying to make it work in terms of ratings and profits. Now, I think that on some issues, uh, the Republican Party hierarchy and the Democratic Party, uh, there's no difference in terms of foreign policy of this administration 
with few exceptions, it's just been horrendous. Uh, and it is uh, similar to uh, the Republican Party record under Bush. On other issues, domestic issues, there are some differences. But ultimately, there are sacrosanct targets such as corporate power, uh, the prerogative of the U.S. military to go around the world killing people when somebody in the White House decides that's okay. Uh, and those deeper questions are really being dodged by Fox as well as MSNBC. How do you combat the idea when people, when people say to you or you hear people say that the news media is liberal, what do you usually say in response to that? Yeah, well, I say, well, what do you mean by liberal? I mean, you alluded to the uh, polls uh, that uh, show that most uh, journalists in the news media vote Democratic. And first, voting Democratic is not exactly a Karl Marx activity. <laughs> but the other point is that uh, these are hierarchies. These corporate media outlets have a pyramid with the power residing at the top. And the people who are the daily reporters and editors, um, the lower you go on the totem pole, the less power they have. And they're routinely falling all over themselves uh, to not uh, irritate or anger uh, the policymakers at the top of those institutions. Uh, by analogy, uh, the people who are flipping hamburgers at McDonald's don't make policy. Uh, they don't decide uh, major issues of how McDonald's operates. And basically, the vast majority of journalists working for uh, media outlets in the United States, they're not that different from hamburger flippers. And they don't make policy. And as you go up the hierarchy of these uh, media institutions, including daily newspapers and the networks, it gets more and more conservative. And that's reflected in the endorsements. When uh, you come around to presidential elections, you have a vast number of these newspapers, for instance, that employ reporters and editors who vote Democratic. And the newspapers uh, very often are endorsing right-wing Republican candidates. So that's where the power resides in the U.S. news media. So what do you think about a guy like Tom Brokaw? Um, for instance, he's considered, you know, everybody looks to him as, as he's this wise elder statesman and uh, he's going to give you the straight dope about stuff. Um, and he knows a lot about America because he's flown over it a bunch in his jet. But what do you uh, what, what do you think about a guy like him? Yeah, well, Tom Brokaw is somebody who had a very illustrious career as a flunky for the power structure. And don't take my word for it. If you look at the Senate Intelligence Committee report that just came out, uh, he was one of the people uh, who the Pentagon, uh, rather the CIA, leaked uh, classified information to because the CIA knew that Brokaw would make its interrogation program, its brutal interrogation program, look good. And if you go back and see the content analysis of what Tom Brokaw did, and, and frankly, uh, Dan Rather as well, uh, during the wars of the 1980s and 90s, you know, invasions of uh, uh, Grenada, Grenada and Panama in the 1980s and the Central America Wars and the first Gulf War, 1991, and on and on. Tom Brokaw basically was a mouthpiece for the war makers. And now he's uh, uh, trying to be a sort of an elder statesman. Uh, but uh, this is the functionality that earned the fame and millions of dollars every year for uh, someone like Brokaw. So what do you think we can do? So, uh, you, know, you know, journalism is such an important profession that it's one of the three professions contained in the Constitution, because the Founding Fathers knew the importance of a, a good journalism. Now, what do we do to get back to that? Is, is it, it, I mean, I think it's all over, <laughs> and I'm getting ready to move to Cuba, but I don't think, what, is there anything that we can do to kind of uh, to get our media back on the side of the truth tellers? Uh, I don't know where you should move, Jimmy. Maybe you shouldn't move anywhere. You know, when people talk about whether the United States has a good health care plan, we have a really good health care plan in the United States, and that is to move to Canada. <laughs> uh, but in terms of the future of journalism, like everything else, we have to fight for it. 
if we leave it to the power structure, the power structure will take away our freedoms more and more. Uh, so I think a lot of the challenge is to organize politically because uh, the FCC is dominated by corporate types uh, to organize to challenge the existing media power structures that are sitting on the windpipe of the First Amendment and to nurture the independent media outlets. And we're talking on one of them, Young Turks. Many, many uh, people are on the Internet, uh, films, radio, documentaries, television, whatever we can do to get a words in edgewise and to fight like hell. That's really where the future is. And, you know, I think that we have to support out of necessity, support organizations that are fighting this fight. And, you know, some of my favorites and I, you know, I'm biased because I'm involved with them. Uh, Fair.org, Fairness and Accuracy in Reporting on a shoestring fighting battles uh, that have got to be fought in terms of media bias. Uh, we at rootsaction.org have been very involved in organizing. We now have half a million active online members at rootsaction.org. And if somebody goes to rootsaction.org and signs up, uh, then it will be half a million and one. So it's a step-by-step -step process. Uh, and that's our only hope. Are you optimistic or are you pessimistic? I'm pessimistic. Well, I like to quote the great anti-fascist Antonio Gramsci, who talked about the need for pessimism of the intellect and optimism of the will. So there are many great, salient, powerful reasons to be pessimistic, but it's the optimism of the will that's got to carry us through. As bad as things are, if, if people weren't fighting like hell every day, things would be worse. And some miraculous events, and I, again, would put miraculous in quotes, events have happened because people were willing to fight like hell, whether it was ending apartheid in South Africa or any other number of activities we could mention. It didn't happen just by chance. It's because people fought against the odds and won. Well, I think there's, there's one thing that we can do is, you know, money has infected everything from our politics to our media, and that's why we have a sick society. Right now we're living in the new Gilded Age, which Mark Twain told us the Gilded Age was that we have a sick society, but if there's a thin veil of gold on the top, so you don't really notice. And, you know, 50% of all wage earners in America now earn less than $30,000. So I think people are, they've gotten people too busy being obedient workers to have time to really notice what's going on. And um, the people who do notice what's going on, the corporation offers them millions of dollars. Now, if General Electric offered you $10 million a year or $5 million a year, like they gave Chris Matthews, do you think you'd still be spouting off like this? Or you just kind of uh, upset that you didn't get your piece of the pie? No, I'm upset that the pie is being hogged by just a few uh, wealthy individuals and uh, uh, pernicious corporations. You know, I'm, I'm 63 years old and I think if I was going to sell out, I would have done that a long time ago. And there's a lot of people like me who just can't stomach the idea of a country and a world being run by these uh, greedy hogs. So, you know, this is a, it's a political issue. You might say it's a moral and spiritual issue. However, we frame it, the, the challenge is there and the opportunity is there. I don't know, just being a robot or a uh, syncophant for the powerful, that sounds like a, a pretty a dreadful life to me. It sounds sort of boring, but it also sounds uh, uh, highly creepy. And um, among other things, we don't want to live creepy lives, hopefully. So there are some alternatives we can create. So uh, I, I always recommend people to go to wolf-pack.com because I think the only cure for this is to get money out of politics. And then we have to break up the big media companies. We need another Teddy Roosevelt. And what I've said a lot is that, you know, FDR said that uh, government by organized money is just as bad as government by organized mob. And that's what we have today, right? Because the bankers are literally criminals. Um, they just rewrote the laws. And even the laws they break, they don't get enforced against them because it would hurt the market. Like when the HBC bank got caught laundering hundreds of millions of drug money and nobody went to jail for it, which is great. So I think we need to get money out of politics and then we have to kind of reverse engineer it. Then we can break up the media companies that way. And um, I thought Barack Obama, now I, you were a Barack Obama delegate. I was also 
uh, people like to ridicule me and say like, oh, you were, you were so foolish that you thought that he was a liberal. He was never a liberal as if they were, you know, super smart and they knew better than me or something. But, um, you know, uh, the reason why, I, you know, um, Barack Obama proposed the Republican health care plan, which is unbelievable. He had Democratic House, Democratic Senate. He's a Democrat. And he says, let's fix health care. Well, let's, what do the Republicans want to do? Let's do that. So when we never get a liberal government anymore. So I think we got to get money out of uh, politics, wolf pack.com Do you agree with that idea? Well, I think it's one of the imperatives, and I'm glad you mentioned Franklin Delano Roosevelt, uh, because one of the things he said when he was running for re-election in 1936 at a rally in Madison Square Garden, he said, um, <clears throat> the rich on Wall Street, they hate me, and I welcome their hatred. Yes. What a contrast to Barack Obama, who says, in effect, uh, the wealthy may hate me, uh, but I want them to love me. And... Uh, since President Obama, through his policies, if not his rhetoric, wants Wall Street and the wealthy to love him, uh, then uh, the tailspin for the average working person, wannabe working person, the children, the elderly, the tailspin has continued. The, the gaps between rich and poor are not an accident. And, you know, the Obama administration has, uh, has accentuated the problem. Yeah, there's, you know, my theory was that you don't get to be you know, he spent his whole life making rich white people comfortable with his blackness, right? And you don't get to be the first black editor of the Harvard Law Review by being a black guy who stirs shit up, <laughs> right? You get Well, you know, it's so unfortunate that a tremendous opportunity uh, was there, uh, especially after the 2008 economic collapse. The parallels with 1933 in uh, two in 2009 were striking and uh, the opportunity for public investment was great. And, you know, we can blame Obama and we should, but we should also say that progressives should have fought him like hell from the first moment when he was doing all this bad stuff. And there was a tendency to just cut him some slack. And uh, we should not do that with anybody in office ever we should be independent. And as a matter of fact, just to digress for a moment, the reason Jeff Cohen and I founded RootsAction.org is because we were sick and tired of groups like Move On sucking up uh, the Democrats. God damn it. And that has been just a chronic problem when a policy from the Bush administration would be denounced and then the same things done by uh, the Obama administration and there's this deathly silence. We cannot afford to have that kind of duplicity and double standard. So um, I agree with you. I agree with you know, every, 100%. I agree with you. Uh, let's just talk about Elizabeth Warren really quickly. Do you think that uh, she's, is she the new Barack Obama? And when she be gets to, uh, to become president, she's going to sell out immediately also? Or do you think she's the real deal? Well, you know, one never knows for sure what someone would do. And can tell on bedrock economic policies, uh, she seems to be pretty much the real deal in terms of challenging Wall Street. At the same time, when you look at Elizabeth Warren's foreign policy, um, it's just atrocious. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's like Hillary Clinton's. And she's just repeating talking points she's getting from the supposed smart guys in the U.S. foreign policy establishment. So um, it's really taken me aback a little bit uh, to see some of the bandwagon as though uh, Elizabeth Warren is a second coming when the militarism, the warfare state, the perpetual war that she has signed on to can only devastate our country in the future as it has in the past and the present. Yeah, oh, I, OK, I uh, sadly agree with you there, too. Uh, let me ask you a question about now you ran for Congress and you uh, were in a generally progressive district against a run-of-the-mill Democrat, establishment Democrat, and yet you didn't win. Why do you think that is? Well, I mean, there are a lot of factors. The guy I ran against uh, was a six-year veteran of the state legislature and had access to a lot of just that uh, sort of clout. And so, you know, we, we did the best we could, but he's somebody who had had a lot of uh, chits uh, to cash in. 
and uh, you know a lot of name familiarity and all the rest of that. Um, I think as we looked at our district, the farther north we got from the Golden Gate Bridge to the Oregon border, uh, the more conservative it got. And so one would not want to overstate uh, the progressivism in uh, Marin, Sonoma, Mendocino, Humboldt, uh, Del Norte counties, et cetera. So that was certainly a factor. Um, there's also uh, the reality that we had a top two primary system instituted at that point in California. And so um, I ended up coming within 0.1% of getting through the primary to the general election, uh, which was tough. Uh, but frankly, um, there would have been a ton of bricks dropped on me had I gotten through the primary because um, a lot of my viewpoints are just um, way more progressive than most of the district. And that's, you know, that's part of the challenge. So, you know, Reese, I don't understand, you know, um, news people often say, uh, even with this past, this past spending bill they just passed, like, oh, well, the, uh, the, 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 a lot of Democrats were against it, but, you know, conservatives are for it. What is conservative about funneling money upward to Wall Street. I don't understand that. I mean, the Tea Party people were supposed to be just as upset with the uh, TARP funds and all that stuff, but it doesn't seem to ever register in their voting habits. Why do you think that is? Well, I think part of it is just the, the conditioning and the propaganda, but also I think that problem has been accentuated by the direction of the Democratic Party leadership in the last couple of decades. It was a tragic dynamic where the Obama administration aligned itself with the status quo. Rather than aligning itself with economic populism and truly challenging the banks and Wall Street, it aligned itself with the banks and Wall Street and the TARP bailout and so forth. So a lot of people with sort of ambiguous politics and populist anger, uh, they saw quite rightly the Obama administration as part of the economic power structure. Uh, that was shafting them. And that really opened the door for a Tea Party to, in its bogus bullshit way, claim the mantle of economic populism, you know, funded by the great economic populists like uh, Dick Army, you know, just very sleazy, multimillionaire aligned corporate people. So I think as long as you have the Democratic Party leadership, rhetoric aside, in terms of policy aligning itself, with a repressive um, power structure that makes a few people rich and immiserates m more people, then you're gonna have this where there's no avenue open through the Democratic Party for genuine economic populism. Um, sadly, I agree with everything you're saying. Now, um, what, is, what has happened to Phil Donahue? I, I mean, when he went away on MSNBC, I never saw him again. What's he doing? Oh, Phil's great. Phil's still doing a lot. As a matter of fact, uh, he campaigned with me uh, for several days uh, when I ran for Congress in 2012. And we showed his film, which is still showing. He put millions of dollars and years and years of his life into a film called Body of War. And I recommend everybody to, you know, whether it's Netflix or whatever the way is, I think it's uh, uh, watchable online for free, Body of War where he shows through a documentary the connection between the warmonger cowardice on Capitol Hill voting for the invasion of Iraq and the suffering of one uh, U.S. veteran who was wounded in Iraq, came home horrible suffering as a result. So, you know, Phil Donahue keeps on keeping on, and Body of War is a, a great documentary. Oh, okay, well, I'd love to have him on this show to talk about it. Does he do interviews? I bet he would. As a matter of fact, uh, I can't speak for him by any means, but uh, send me a note and I'll certainly forward it on to him. All right. Well, that sounds fantastic. Well, Norman Solomon, I really appreciate you taking time out to talk to us today. And uh, I'm sure it's been enlightening to our viewers. It certainly has been to me. It's been great to talk with you. Thanks for doing the work you do. Thanks for uh, having an optimistic heart. And um, I hope to talk to you again soon. Oh, me too. Hey, thanks, Jimmy.